I'm Curtis Cummings, and I lead the no-code infrastructure team at OnDeck. OnDeck helps people start companies, scale companies, and improve themselves through continuous career learning. Now, you've probably never heard of a no-code infrastructure team. And that's because I think we're one of the first. We use no-code so heavily that we create a team that helps everyone at OnDeck build no-code solutions at scale. Now, if you have questions during the talk, drop them in the chat box below, and I'll be back to answer them live after this session. Now, in November of last year, I joined OnDeck as a software engineer. The thing that struck me was how much product they shipped with such a small team. They had an internal version of LinkedIn where fellows could connect with one another and watch previous sessions. They had a founder tool that matched them to investors. And they also had a really complex application system and admission workflow complete with very complex application lifecycle. I was surprised to see how many people were involved in shipping product at OnDeck. It was every single person. This challenged what I knew about traditional software companies. Usually if you're shipping product, you had some developers. But here at OnDeck, what I was witnessing was the beginning of a no-code first culture where product development is decentralized and everyone is empowered to build their own solutions. Now, imagine this, you're not limited by what your product team can deliver. You could go into work tomorrow and ship that MVP. You could automate that process. You can run those experiments. Think of the amazing things you could ship and how much value you could create for your customers. This is just a glimpse of what a no-code first culture can enable. I've been on the ground floor helping cultivate this culture at OnDeck as we've grown to over 250 people. I wanna tell you exactly how we do it so you can too, which is why we're here. In this talk, I wanna help you build a business case for a no-code first culture, share a framework we've developed at OnDeck to build products in a decentralized way. Finally, I'll share some of the learnings we've had along the way so you don't have to repeat the same mistakes. Now, whether you're a founder, a small company, or giant multinational, or anything in between, the first step is going to be starting to build with no-code. No-code usually starts as a grassroots effort. And if you want to create a no-code first culture, you'll need the support of the whole company, and you'll need executive buy-in. Now, it was interesting at OnDeck because we're early believers in no-code, so we didn't have to convince any executives about what we're doing, but we had to convince people that were joining the team that this is the right way to build things. Now, on the flip side, you'll probably have to convince your co-founder or some executives that this is the right way to do it. And in either case, the approach is the exact same. You wanna present a business case. The business case we're gonna construct is that a no-code first culture allows you to build products faster, cheaper, and easier. Now, business cases need quotes, so here's your first. The potential to reduce development time by 90%. Now that is in a report put out by Red Hat, and this is absolutely insane. Even if we take a pessimistic view of this number, that's 50%, which is twice as fast. But it's not actually. If you think about it, the number of people who can actually build go from a select few, who are your usual developers, to everyone at the company. This allows you to release before anyone else. You can iterate even faster. You collect more data and feedback, and you can just repeat that before your competitors probably even release their first version. Now, let's move on to how no code is cheaper with this juicy quote. It's from a report from Forrester, and it states, the average company avoided hiring two developers, and they're able to increase business value by $4.4 million over a period of three years. So not only are you able to ship with less developers, which are one of your most expensive resources, but your non-developers are able to increase business value using no code. This is something I saw firsthand at OnDeck. We continue to have a product team that's a fraction of the size of similar stage startups, but we ship just as much product as them. We're also much more agile in responding to the market. Finally, building products in no code first culture is easier. There's no fancy quote here because it's from my own experience and it'd be a bit weird to quote myself, but one of the biggest challenges is knowing what to build. We've already established we can ship more faster with no code, which means we can collect data earlier. You can see what's used, what's not, what works and what doesn't from real user feedback. Now, whether you continue scaling using no code or you build something in code, you have real usage data. It's like a cheat code for product building. You know exactly what you need to build. In a past life as a software consultant, I saw many projects fall flat after we launched them. And it's because they're based on specs full of assumptions. We had meetings full of users, don't do this, or users will do that. So many assumptions that when we finally got out to real users, they didn't actually use it the way they assumed. Months of work were scrapped and we had to start all the way over. So to recap our business case, no code culture allows your team to ship product faster, maybe even up to 90% faster. It's cheaper because you use less expensive resources to deliver a serious amount of value and easier because you can eliminate one of the biggest hurdles, which is knowing what to build. Now that you've built your business case, what do you do once you start building? Well, 
how do you scale your products as they go from MVP to full-fledged product? OnDeck designed a framework for this. The product team doesn't actually touch a no-code build or harden it until it's achieved something we call internal product market fit. Now, this is a term coined by Andreas Klinger, our CTO. You might be familiar with what product market fit is. It's when, paraphrased, creating a product that satisfies a market's need and they're willing to pay for that. So internal product market fit is building something with no code and validating that it actually has product market fit. What this means at OnDeck is that with very few exceptions, every single product that we build starts as a no code MVP and goes through this framework. You may have seen this illustration. It's from a very famous article about building MVPs. And what it's trying to convey is that you need to build something to satisfy the user needs. So if they wanna go from point A to point B, the very first version and the simplest thing you could build is probably a skateboard. If you delivered them a set of tires, that's not actually gonna solve their user need. And so it's just a useful visual to keep in mind as we explore this framework. So the first step in this framework is your version zero or V0. Usually this is a super quick prototype, very manual, very little automation, and you release this to a tiny number of users. The goal here is to test your assumptions, validate your hypotheses, or invalidate your hypotheses. You can stay in this stage or any of these stages in this framework as long as you need. Now, I'll use a real life example of something we built at on deck using this exact same framework. And it's called the fundraising concierge. It's that founder investor tool that I mentioned in my intro. To start, it was a giant spreadsheet. It had two tabs, one for founders, and it specified what stage they're at, what they're looking for, and what industry they're in. And then the other tab was a bunch of investors, what typical check size they had, what industries they like to invest in, and a couple other preferences. Now, the V0 version of this was someone sitting in that spreadsheet every single day, matching up people manually. When they found a match, they compose an email, one to the founder, one to the investor. And if both replied back that they'd like to meet, we'd set up a manual Slack uh, channel and we'd introduce the two. It was a huge time sink, but what we were able to do is validate that this service was very, very valuable to our founders. Now, next up is version one, and this is where you can start building with more no-code tools. You also start automating as much as you can, but there's probably gonna be some human intervention. You might at this point bring in some of your operations team. The bulk of your time in the whole development life cycle is going to be spent in this, this stage. It means you're iterating, you're rolling out to more users, and you're acting on that feedback. For fundraising concierge, this is where we automated most of the matchmaking. We also automated the emails that got sent out, and we added a button that when they both clicked yes, we'd automatically set up that Slack channel and introduce the two. We started figuring out what makes good matches and what info each party wants. Now, the next step is your version two, and this is where you've achieved internal product market fit. This is a huge milestone, so congratulations for making it to this point. At this point, this is where product or your no-code infrastructure team gets involved. We harden or scale the no-code tools that you're using. We extract things out that are useful for other teams as building blocks. And maybe you consider parts that you might want to rebuild with code. Now, there are three cases where we choose to replace something with another tool or with code. The first is if it's a very specific feature that we just can't get with off-the-shelf tools. In this case, we'll probably move to a code solution. The second is if the scale is just hard to manage with no-code tools. In this case, it might make sense to move to another tool, upgrade the existing tool to maybe an enterprise offering, or there's always the option to move to code. And the third is if the solution that's offered is just too complex. In this case, it might make sense, again, to upgrade to that enterprise solution, move to a totally different tool, or we can rebuild it with code. Now with fundraising concierge, we automated almost everything away from the manual process. We moved some stuff to another automation platform that was better suited to doing the matchmaking. And we started extracting some of the building blocks for setting out these emails with the buttons and also for automating the Slack intros. Now, the last part of this framework is where you have a stable product. Here, you're iterating, you're hardening as you go. You may choose to switch tools at any time or move certain things to code. For fundraising, we moved a large portion of our matchmaking to code so we could use some machine learning. We also wanted to build a UI and add it to our core product, the, the internal LinkedIn tool that I mentioned in the beginning. We wanted this to not be just an email and Slack solution. We wanted to actually be part of a UI. But the good thing here is a lot of it remained in no code. And that's one thing the no code code dichotomy kind of misses. You don't have to be one or the other. In fact, most products at OnDeck are always a hybrid. You have some things in code where it makes sense and some things in code, no code where that makes sense. And if you need to change tools or move, rebuild something in code, it's not a big deal. 
So that's our framework for decentralizing product development. All products start as no-code MVPs. Product team doesn't get involved until those products achieve internal product market fit. We harden and scale by choosing other tools or rebuilding things in code as we need to. But it doesn't have to be one or the other. The end result is the experts in your company are building what they need and they're closest to the user so they're in the best position to know. And product is only focusing on things that actually have internal product market fit. Now, the last thing I wanna cover is some things that we learned scaling a no-code culture from three people to 250. And it falls into three uh, high-level buckets. That is documentation, service counts, and investing in infrastructure. Now with documentation, the goal is to have a central place to know what's going on, what's being built, and how to rebuild it if you need to. Playbooks and standard operating procedures are best, but if you're strapped for time, you can always record a video via Loom or something like that. Now, the hardest part of documentation is keeping it updated. And so at OnDeck, we encourage people to leave their documentation 1% better than how they found it. This has a compounding effect to it, and you can watch the interest kind of pile up over time. It means we're doing less rewriting and our documentation is up to date. The other thing that we, we really do is invest in onboarding. OnDeck has a two week training program that takes about one to two hours a day where it is essentially just to explore the no-code stack and teach all the tools in our arsenal. Now, service counts is something that we discovered, unfortunately, a little bit too late. And it's quite painful when someone leaves the company, they can leave a trail of destruction in their wake. And it's not physical destruction, it's digital destruction. It's happened more times than I like to admit until we got smart about this. Basically, if someone leaves and they've got a bunch of personal service account, uh, personal accounts attached to your automation tools and all your other tools, their email getting deactivated or their Slack getting turned off is gonna cause a whole bunch of errors. We had single points of failure all over our no-code stack and it led to a lot of things getting shut off without us even knowing about it. Uh, a lot of things that took multiple days to fix. It was a, a giant mess. So do yourself a favor and as soon as you possibly can, invest in some service accounts that uh, you can either set up with shared inboxes or groups for alerts and you can remove that single point of failure. Now, finally, uh, investing in infrastructure is really important. It's something that we've learned at OnDeck as we've scaled these no-code solutions. Things are gonna break and that's just inevitable. Third-party services are gonna go down, but you can kind of mitigate this by monitoring uh, and you can do this by subscribing to their status updates, or you can use one of the many monitoring tools out there. We had some critical automations turn off for days at a time before we even realized something was going wrong. The other thing you can do is invest in data pipelines in a warehouse early. Now, unfortunately, we had to play catch up for a long time because we started this process a little bit too late. But what you really want to do is make sure your no-code tools are feeding into a data pipeline and you're storing that data securely. That also lets you clean that data, and then put it back into your other no-code tools as you scale up. Now, this one's a little bit biased, but once you're creating with no-code, you might want to invest in a team whose job is working on your no-code stack versus working in your no-code stack. It lets them build building blocks that will help other MVPs, and also lets you have someone who is an expert in all the tools that you're using. So these are the lessons that we've learned at OnDeck over the past year. Documentation is absolutely critical, and the hardest thing is keeping it updated, but it is possible to do with certain policies in place. Use service accounts as early as possible to remove those single points of failure and invest in infrastructure and teams that work on your no-code infrastructure, not in your no-code infrastructure. Now, before this talk, you'd probably never heard of a no-code first culture or a no-code infrastructure team. I want you to help me change that. I want you to go back to your company with the benefits we discussed and make the case for building, making no code a bigger part of your product development. You can use the framework I shared as a template and add what makes sense for your company. And along the way, you can avoid repeating the same mistakes we did. Building products in this way has become the norm and you can choose to be at the forefront or you can wait for everyone to lap you. I look forward to seeing you on the bleeding edge of this exciting cultural shift and we're just getting started. Thank you.